So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk specifically about what you do in composing and arranging for the wind band. And in particular, we can kind of talk about the marching aspect of that. Sure. What are some of the mistakes that you see arrangers are making and how would you encourage them or how would you avoid those kind of mistakes? Well, it's interesting that you're asking that, Scott, because I did write for um, a small band this year in Missouri called Liberty High School. And um, great a great little band, you know, but not a lot of players. And so I had to be careful about how I scored, etc. I just wrote with the sound of the band in mind, taking the instrumentation that they had and then orchestrating for that instrumentation in a way that those kids were going to have a really good chance of sounding good. And I know their director's really good, even though there's not a lot of kids yet in the marching band, he'll get it there. Um, But uh, that's what I concentrated on. Am I writing for the mellophones in a range that they're going to be able to be very successful? Occasionally, I push them just a little bit because if the truth be known, no matter what the difficulty level is you're doing, if you go to a competitive event and you're excellent at what you do, it doesn't matter how hard it is. If you're truly excellent, very few bands are. You know, So you can play something simple, and if you do it really, really well, you're going to get credit for it. And your kids are going to feel great about it. And your parents are going to feel great about it. So it's about, like I said earlier, uh, setting them up for success. So I just am very careful about where I place the notes. A lot of people think that to be successful, you have to score the flutes really, really high. So they're heard. Well, what you hear when you score flutes really high is out-of-tune flutes. All right. So you have to be careful to put them just high enough that they'll come through, but that the kids have a fair chance of playing in tune and sounding good. That's when you'll hear the flutes, if they're clear and in tune. Just using common sense. And like I said, writing for the kids that are actually going to be playing it. How do you approach the pacing of a show in terms of its entertainment value versus maybe not wanting to tire out the performers? I mean, how do you, I guess pacing is the question for you. Yeah, I still think pacing is one of the most important things in putting anything together, any kind of program together. Uh, You have to think about the audience. You have to think about the effects. The effect doesn't always have to be loud, and that's what I try to get young directors to understand. You don't have to play loud all the time. You know, there's something to a subtle moment where the audience has to lean in, and then you smack them in the face with a big moment, and they're like, whoa, that's pacing, you know, and that's also effective writing. Really good friend, Lindsay Vento, encourages people to write a timeline, to put together a timeline. And where is the peak of your show going to be? And if the peak of your show is at the end, then where are all the mini peaks that lead to that? And what are you going to, after you get that decided, okay, cool, that's going to be great for the audience. They're going to stay with us. What are we going to do in this segment to get to this little mini peak? Or um, if if we have the peak going the other way where we want it to be so subtle that everyone is leaning in, listening. What are we going to do there to get that to happen? But if you have that timeline kind of established, it's much easier for them then you to plug in music or plug in visual ideas or color guard ideas. Um, so I think she has a great way of explaining that, and that's what I would encourage people to do. What, what do you wish you knew more of from a, a director when they're write, when you're writing for them? Um, the, I've been lucky because the folks I write for are really good about giving me information. Sometimes I get so much information, you know, it's really kind of cool. I mean, someone will send me notes and it will say flutes, two Allstaters, three wannabe Allstaters, um, kids that aren't sure what end to play in of the horn. I mean, they're that detailed with what they have. So when I'm writing first flute parts, obviously it's different than the second flute part that I write. And when I have that kind of information, it's great because I know who I can write for. If, um, if they say to me, keep the third clarinets below the break, that's what I do. Actually, the clarinet sounds great below the break. So um, a lot of times I'll write for the whole clarinet section. But yeah, I, I'd say I'm really lucky that way, but I'd say for people out there that have their shows arranged, make sure your arranger has that kind of information. So what's the creative process look like for you when you're writing a show? Do you start with a piano sketch? I mean, how, how does it work for you? Yeah, I'll usually sketch um, on piano, and I learned that from my dear friend Mike Sweeney at Hal Leonard, uh, who's really good at, uh, about doing sketches. You know, it was hard for me at first because I just wanted to get it done. You know, I wanted it to get done. I thought if I'm doing full measures at a time, it'll get done quicker. 
but I learned it doesn't mean it's going to get done better. So I, I'll tend to do a piano sketch. Uh, but when I'm sure of something, uh, I will, I'll have the piano sketch. I usually have the piano score in between the woodwinds and brass on the score. But when I'm sure of something, I'll just take that part. I'll go ahead and throw it into the woodwind part or low brass part or wherever it's going to be or mellophones or trumpets. Uh, because that's a moment where I feel confident. That's what I want. And other places where I don't, I'll finish the sketch, go back, look at the places that I was really confident about, and then work backwards from those places to see how we're going to orchestrate. Are there certain kinds of music that influence your composing? Is there something that is that you resonate with more than others? Um, I'm a big musical theater person. Uh, I, you know... Um, Recently, the musical Wicked, I thought, was uh, just amazing what Stephen Schwartz did. Um, it was funny because we did arrangements of it for Hal Leonard, and Stephen didn't necessarily understand the mellophone and the ranges. And I remember we wrote some notes that weren't quite the melody because the mellophone needed to stay in the range. And he said, nope, put that note back in there. So we've had some great experiences and learning from those folks too. But jazz, uh, Pat Metheny has always been a huge influence on me. Uh, I'm still waiting, by the way, not that I'm critical about what's being written today, but I'm still waiting for music, whether it be orchestral, jazz, whatever, to hit me the way that Pat Metheny's music hit me years ago, because nothing has hit me like that. Um, he was that unique and, and different. And um, listening to him changed the way that I wrote, especially harmonically. So, um, and then Aaron Copeland. Uh, I, I still love listening to anything written by Aaron Copeland uh, because he just wrote so beautifully. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I was motivated by a lot of different kinds of music, uh, a lot of great band composers out there that I continue to listen to and try to model myself after so what advice would you give a young composer or arranger looking to get started in their um, path that you've been on? Study scores. Study scores. Uh, studying scores are just as good as any composition lesson. I really believe that. Uh, you look at a great orchestrated score. Um, John Adams. And people, as soon as I say that, they're gonna, people are going to think, now wait a minute, Richard, he's a minimalist composer. If you think he's a minimalist composer, go in and look at one of his scores. And because people say, oh, he just throws a bunch of rhythms around. Go look at one of his scores. You will be blown away how everything is connected. Everything has a reason. Um, it just, I don't know how he does it. I think he's from another planet. You know, but by looking at those scores, I still realize how much I have to learn. And he just writes these operas in a few days, you know, he writes all these pieces, these orchestra pieces that are amazing, you know, in a few weeks. And I'm like, man, I'm struggling to get a measure done in a week, you know. So it's, it's about studying scores and study scores of, of people that you particularly enjoy listening to and see how they do it. Because it's a great way. I think it's the quickest way to learn how to do what we do. Well, it has been absolutely awesome spending this time with you. Thank you for your Thanks. insights and being a part of this. Well, great to be here with you and thank you.